Hi, Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another of the new Savvy Sightseer video vacation series. Today we are off to northern Italy. My first introduction to Italy was when I was 16, and it was not my favorite experience. It was one of five countries we toured in only two weeks. I didn't feel I got to know much of anything about any of the countries, nor the people or the culture. So when I decided to go back to Italy, I wanted to really see a piece of the country and so narrowed my focus to the northern region. Today we'll start in Milan, the capital of Italy's Lombardy region, and then we'll journey to Verona, the home of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Next we'll check out the northern lakes, and then we'll cap our tour in the Cinque Terre, dubbed the Italian Riviera. So settle in and relax, we are off to Milan. Milan has been called the fashion capital of the world, and they want to make sure visitors get that message as soon as they arrive. This steel and plastic sculpture does a good job of doing that. You see on the left, that's a needle with thread that it's pulling through across under the street, where on the other side you see the knot. Here is the majestic Duomo, the historical center of Milan. This Gothic cathedral was hundreds of years in the making. It was built from 1386 into the 1880s. So whole generations of families took part in its construction. Its unusual pink marble is quarried from Candolier and transported about 65 miles to Milan. It is the fourth largest cathedral in the world and can hold up to 40,000 people. I'm boggled by the delicacy and detail work done all the way back in the 14th century. When you think about what tools did they have then? Just chis chisels and talent. The marble is very beautiful, but it is also very fragile and needs constant restoration. Reportedly in a span of about 50 to 100 years, all the stones have to be replaced. To get a close-up view of the Duomo, I got creative and went up to the seventh floor outdoor cafe of La Renascente across the square. It's Italy's oldest department store format opened in 1917. When I turned to walk back through the store, I was met with an artwork of a completely different type. Stunning shoes and bags, highlighting Milan's status of a fashion capital. But these were made entirely of chocolate. Definitely too pretty to eat. Next door is Milan's version of the Smithhaven Mall, named for the first king of Italy, the Galleria Vittorio Emmanuel II. It was built in the late 1800s, and it is the oldest enclosed shopping mall in the world. It's also the first building in Milan that got electric light. It certainly doesn't look like our malls. There's a glass and steel vaulted ceiling here. You'll also find the flagship stores for the first Prada, Gucci, and Louis Vuitton. There's even a fashionable mosaic floor. Urban folklore has it that if you place your heel in the bowl, spin three times, you'll be sure to return to Milan. Judging by how well-worn the spot is, a lot of people fall in love with Milan and want to make sure they get back to return to it. At one exit of the mall is a tribute to one of Italy's most revered sons, Leonardo da Vinci. He lived here in Milan from 1492 to 1500 under the patronage of the Sforza ruling family. He is considered one of the greatest of Renaissance men. Reliefs on the monument depict some of the disciplines that da Vinci mastered, painting, sculpting, architecture, and civil engineering. He ultimately designed waterways and even locks to facilitate transporting that candolier marble for the Duomo. At the base are four of his favorite students, and that serves as a reminder that he also paid it forward by training new artists. A highlight for any traveler to Milan is the Church of Santa Maria della Grazia to see one of da Vinci's greatest works, The Last Supper. There are many symbols and secrets hidden in the scene, such as the calm central figure amid a storm of emotion around him. And also there's the strange organization of groups of three, which we will look at closer in a minute. Da Vinci's main talent was in creating depth. Even standing in front of this, it was hard to remember it was flat. There were no arches. He used an experimental painting technique, but it was a failure and has had many restorations since he finished the three-year project in 1498. It is a huge fresco, about 29 feet across and 15 feet high. The cutout in the center was originally an entrance to the monk's dining room. Although the church was heavily bombed in World War II, the wall remained standing thanks to the monument's men. This group, highlighted in the George Clooney movie, 
really existed and was tasked with trying to save treasures from destruction toward the end of World War II. They jury-rigged a scaffold of steel bars and sandbags around the wall. After the raid, it, as well as the wall opposite with another important fresco, Giovanni Donato's 1495 crucifixion, were still standing. Moving east from Milan, we find Verona and the Ponte Pietra over the Adagi River. The, this Roman arch was built originally in the first century BC. At the end of World War II, Germans bombed the bridge to isolate the residents, but locals were so distraught to lose their precious artifact, they dove into the river to retrieve as much of the original white Roman marble they could so that they could rebuild it. Of course, there are many very beautiful things to see in Verona, like this Roman arena that still functions. It was built in the first century, about 30 AD. Also made of pink marble, it is the third largest Roman amphitheater in Italy. About 30,000 spectators once were able to fill it, but due to current regulations, only about half of that can. Otherwise, people could see Dante Square, where thousands of years of architecture surround a statue of the famous author of the Inferno and Divine Comedy. Or, visitors could admire the intricate collection of fine mausoleums of the once powerful Scaligeri family, rulers of Verona in the 13th and 14th century. But, more often, they flock to see the symbols of Shakespeare's drama, Romeo and Juliet, which starts in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. Many of Shakespeare's storylines were based on real events, like the 12th century feuding Montecchi and Capoletti families. He changed their names, but only slightly, to the Montagues and Capulets. This, reportedly, was Romeo's house. The Montecchi home features an unusual roof line called an inverted pontiff's hat. Nearby is, of course, Juliet's house and the balcony of such fame. Verona embraces, or shall we say exploits, its association with the popular star-crossed lovers, and this court is quite a draw. Below is a wall devoted to lovers, and there's the locks of love. The tradition is to put your names onto the lock and close it over the railing, and you will then be lovers forever. When I was there, trouble brewed for a newlywed couple. All excited, the new bride turned to her groom, but it appeared he forgot to bring one. Fortunately, vendors are on hand nearby to sell new ones. Another legend is to rub the breast of Juliet's statue for luck in love. Well, this guy clearly decided if rubbing one brings luck, two rubs must bring more. <laughs> I disguised him in case his wife finds this picture. North of Verona is the Lake District. The first lake you come to is Lake Garda, the largest lake. On a peninsula at the southern end of it is the ancient town of Sermion, first inhabited during the first century B.C., the Scaligeri family built a castle and fortress town here in the 13th century, for whenever they wanted time away from Verona. Part of its appeal then, and now, are its natural thermal springs. There are even ruins of ancient Roman changing rooms. It oozes old world charm. Ancient buildings, narrow roads, all kinds of shops, very serene in its largely earth tones of beige and gold. That is, until you turn a corner, and come across this vivid splash of color, wisteria covering a building. Little Garter is farther up the coast, and is very typical of towns lining the lake. There's tiny, twisty lanes, and here I was struck by the smell of fresh leather. A fun thing to do is to watch all the souvenir-buying Americans try to work out the metric system to figure out how many centimeters equate to a 36-inch belt. A truly pretty lake and one that is more familiar to Americans because of its famous resident, is Lake Como. George and Amal Clooney own a villa on the picturesque shore. Brad Pitt often stayed at the smaller cottage next door. To the left, you see a very common sight in this part of Italy, pencil pines, so nicknamed for their tall, narrow shape. Reportedly, George was recently offered $100 million for the villa he bought for only about $13 million in 2002. The lake is ringed by the Alps in the distance, and another town on the lake is Lake Bellag is Bellagio, so picturesque it is dubbed the Pearl of the Lake. Impossibly small lanes loaded with inviting shops sell exquisite one-of-a-kind goods like hand-painted sc silk scarves. Italy's northern lake region includes cosmopolitan Lake Lugano, 
That's shared with Switzerland. A small piece of the shoreline is Italy's and decidedly more Italian than Swiss. It's a modern financial center with chic shopping along pedestrian walkways. While most visitors flock to its famous casino or to the labyrinth of streets and shops, a short walk along the shore delivers one of the most beautiful experiences in town a 14th century church of St. Mary of the Angels. Its bland exterior doesn't prepare you for what's inside. With the Renaissance frescoes by Bernardino Luini, and all for free. Luini was a contemporary of da Vinci, but nobody's quite sure about the relationship or how their paths crossed, but it is widely believed that he was pro probably a former student of da Vinci's. The painstakingly detailed presentation of the Passion and Crucifixion of Christ has perhaps one of the world's first selfies, a self-portrait of Luini there on the horse. Most fascinating is his markedly different take on the Last Supper. This was painted in 1529, long before Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code questioned the participant's identity. Luini's work is separated into three panels because it had originally been on a wall of a monastery rectory and was painted around the support pillars. It was later moved to the vestibule of the church. There are some sim similarities with da Vinci's masterpiece, for example, the groupings of three beyond the three separate panels. Here are the two for comparison. Da Vinci's is on top, Luini's is on bottom. In both, you have the center focusing on the Christ figure after telling the apostles that one of them will betray him. Like da Vinci's, there is the calm against the animation, but there are some differences. In da Vinci's one, there seems to be a knife held at a very odd angle. It's believed to be held by Peter, but da Vinci was an expert at anatomy, and so there is a question as to whether or not there is an apostle that we can't see and that the knife is actually in his hand. Notice the difference in how the knife is positioned in Luini's one on the bottom. There's also the question of the figure next to the Christ figure. Is that the apostle John in da Vinci's version, or is it the Mary Magdalene character in the second one in Luini's? Also notice where Judas is. In Da Vinci's, he is on the left of the Christ figure as we look at him. And Christ's hands are held at different angles. The one that's facing Judas is clenched. The one that is away is open. Whereas in Luini's one on the bottom, it's the exact reverse. Judas is on the right side of the Christ figure, and that is the hand that is clenched, whereas the hand on the opposite direction is open. There's spilled salt that could symbolize bad luck. And if that Judas figure on the bottom looks a little familiar, well, yep, there it is with Luini doing another selfie as Judas. It is really hard to pick which of Italy's lakes is the most stunning, but this one is definitely a contender. This is Lake Maggiore, the second largest lake in Italy and the westernmost in the Lake District. It's about a one-hour train ride from Milan. This town is Stressa and it was the setting for a farewell to arms by Hemingway. Its unique feature is a group of garden islands belonging to the Borromeo fa family, who were, actually are, rich aristocrats. This family hit the trifecta of importance and are highly regarded in finance, politics, and religion. The closest of the family islands to Stressa is Isola Bella, which has been in the Borromeo family since the 1500s. It was built by bringing boats filled with soil. What it started as a concept of Count Carlo III's to have a small house with a delightful garden of citrus and flowers and a residence for the pleasure and recreation of his lady, the Countess Donna Isabella. Ah, uh, well, it became under his success of Vitelliano VI an over-the-top summer home. Building started in 1630. It took about 40 years to finish. The front of it is designed as a prow of, ship, of a ship at full sail. Vitliano's vision was to build a showy pleasure palace, a playground for the many noble guests who would visit it. It was designed both to entertain as well as to demonstrate the money and power of the Borromeo family. There are gorgeous interiors, like the music room. History could have been changed here. There was a peace conference in 1935 with Italy, Britain, and France but they couldn't agree on how to control Hitler. Otherwise, they could have changed the course of the war. Outside is even more fantastic with formal gardens. This was quite the hot spot on the aristocratic social circles. In 1797, Napoleon, tired of waiting for an invite, decided to invite himself. 
According to the cur current Principessa, the court count at the time refused to receive him. In fact, they say he actually left the island. And in letters found from the estate's agent to the count, Napoleon and his entourage showed up and were evidently the house guests from hell. Napoleon, one to hold a grudge, later destroyed one of the Borromeo mainland palaces. It was an important one to the family. It was where one of the Carloses had been born. He was the nephew of Pope Pius IV and himself went on to become the Archbishop of Milan and later was made a saint in 1610. Along the way, he had sold the family title for charity. The title, title was later restored and the family was then elevated to prince status, but essentially in name only. I loved these this group of white peacocks that were allowed to roam freely on the grounds. The current head of the family is Vitliano XI. He became the prince early in 2015 when his father died. The landing dock here has been pictured in recent years as the arrival spot for guests for his cousin's weddings. Although the island is generally accessible, it is still private and is closed to the public when the family wants it all to themselves for special events. It was the lavish reception venue when Countess Lavinia Borromeo married John Elkin in 2004. He was the fiat chairman. And again, it was for her sister Mathilde when she married German Prince Antonius von Furstenberg in 2011. And in the summer of 2015, it was used when Beatrice married Pierre, the grandson of Grace Kelly and the heir to the throne of Monaco. Talk about some power couples. The next island out is Isola Pescatore. This is basically a fisherman's island. Originally, it was designed as a rural retreat and today is filled with delightful lakeside restaurants and a lot of souvenir shops. Isola Madre was designed originally as a garden getaway and stocked with exotic birds. The palace here predates Isola Bella by nearly a hundred years, and the wedding church here can be used only by the Borromeo family. Across the lake from these is Verbana and the 40-acre Villa Toronto Botanical Gardens. A Scottish captain wanted to create the most impressive botanical gardens in the world, and he realized his native Scotland wasn't exactly the place for it. So he came here and bought a hundred acres of land in 1931. When done, he donated the property to the Italian state, but it was as a living trust, so he lived there until he died in 1964. The villa is now used as government offices, but the gardens are open to the public. And he had succeeded in establishing amazing gardens. There are over 80,000 blooming plants, lotus flowers, azaleas, hydrangeas, water lilies, and rare botanical selections. It was designed for symmetry. Could I have had a better day to take this particular picture? And, of course, for beauty and for peace. Our last stop today is about a three-hour train ride south of Milan to the Cinque Terre, also known as the Italian Riviera. These are five fishing villages basically that were lost in time because they were so isolated. Originally, the main access was only by boat, but that was not easy for each of the villages. Eventually, a train tunnel was blasted through the mountains to connect the villages. Tourists flocked to see the quaint towns, and fortunately, city officials realized the value of keeping them as natural as possible and not giving in to commercialization. So now, it's popular to take the train and stop at each village along the way, with the first being Monterosa. This is famous for its pesto, wine, and olive oil. It's also the only one with a natural sandy beach, and so is the most accessible by boat. Next comes Vernazza. This was badly hit in the flood of 2011. Rain and mud poured down from the hills and filled the street you see in front of you. We're going to skip the third one for now and go on to Manarola. I enjoyed the view until I zeroed in on what was happening on the cliff in front of me, rock diving into what appeared to be very shallow waters. The last little town is Rio Maggiore. Although there is a path linking each town called the Azure Way, some parts are quite rugged. Except for the half-mile walkway from Manarola to Rio Maggiore, dubbed the Via del Amore, or the Love Way. A lot of people will train to Manarola, then walk the path to Rio Maggiore for the breathtaking scenery. From here, it's fun to take the ferry, with stops in each village back to Monterosa for a different perspective to see the towns from the sea. And that's how I viewed Cornelia. That was the middle town that I had skipped before. 
The train does stop here, but along the water's edge at the bottom of the screen. And then there's about 380 steps switched back to get up to the town itself. The story goes that fishermen painted their homes in different colors to be able to easily spot their house from the water as they returned from the sea, making this colorful town a natural for the cover of picture calendars. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss and say sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to say to that to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. Now, if you'd like to see more of Italy or any of my European destinations, go to my website. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Stay healthy, stay home. Ciao.